Authors Over 50, Writing in Life's Sweetest Third. Authors Over 50's weekly podcast celebrates writers and their journeys to publication. Writing after 50 is a whole story on its own, so let's skip to Life's Sweetest Third and talk with authors about their journey from pen to publish. Welcome, I'm Julia Daly, your host, and I invite you to listen to interviews with writers who've achieved their goal of publishing a book just later in life. We've seen award lists for under 30 or under 40, but I've yet to see lists for those who've achieved a significant milestone of their own, launching a new career and publishing their first book after the age of 50. We will hear about these authors' inspirations, struggles, strategies, and the smell of that first book. These writers' journeys inspire me because I'm one of them. My guest majored in book illustration at the Parsons School of Design and studied under Marie Sendak. She is a member of Sisters in Crime, Mystery Writers of America, and the Historical Novel Society, and has published books in mystery and horror magazines and anthologies. The Gallery of Beauties is her debut novel, and its sequel, The Courtesan's Secret, will be released in summer 2023. She is currently the CEO of a digital marketing agency in New York City. Welcome to Authors Over 50, Nina Waxman. Thank you. Great to be here and excited to be on this, especially for women over 50. It's very important that women know that you can still reinvent yourself over 50. So true. And Nina, our opening question is always, what took you so long to write your first book? Um, What happened was I was always interested in writing, but it was between writing and art. When I was growing up and when I was going into college, I had to make the decision, do I want to go to art school or do I want to go to a regular college and pursue literature or writing? And I decided to go for art school. So I went to art school and I studied art. And I one of the great things about art school was it gave me the chance to read a lot of books because I studied book illustration. So I got I figured that was like the best of both worlds that I got to read great books and illustrate them. But then the reality, I ended up going into advertising because book illustration does not pay very well. So I ended up in advertising and I always put aside, although I worked with a writer in partnership, uh, I was a creative director. Um, so I did have a chance to indulge writing, but I always had this secret fantasy of someday going back to writing. And it was when, um, my brother, I have two younger, two younger brothers and my brother, my first younger brother passed away several years ago in his fifties. And then I realized now is the time you can't keep your dreams forever. You have to realize that, you know, you're, you know, you're over 50, it's time to start actualizing some of the things you always wanted to do. So I had always subscribed to the writer magazine and I had a little pile of it and I would always look through it. And one of the things I saw in the writer magazine was the conferences. And I always swore to myself, one day I'm going to go to those conferences. And that really was what pushed me ahead was getting into those conferences. I think being around a community of writers is so important and we learn yes. so much from each other and it's such a generous community. Yes, it is amazing. And, you know, the first conference I went to, I like mysteries. Another thing I think that as a writer is what you like to read ends up being what you like to write. And I love mysteries and in particular historical mysteries. And I've traveled a lot. So always in my head on all these trips, I kept thinking about what a great story this will make. And um, and then when I went to Munich, we went to the palace of Ludwig uh, I, Nymphenburg Palace, and there he had a gallery of beauty, literally, um, which is a portrait gallery. He hired his court painter to paint the portraits of the most beautiful women in Munich. And he had about 140 paintings that were from all walks of life all over the gallery. And I'd always been, you know, and it just was so amazing. I bought the book for the gallery and I read up each one of the women who are portraits in there. Um, And then I thought, wow, this is a great idea for a book. 
set in Venice because Venice was known for its beautiful women. People went to Venice in, you know, on the grand tour, noblemen went to Venice because it was renowned for its beautiful women. So that's how I actually came up. That's what triggered the moment where I said it's time to really write this book. Well, you studied under one of the greats in book illustration. Can you tell us more about Marie Sendak? Yeah, Marie Sendak was a great guy and a natural born storyteller. And he was very encouraging. And when we did, we all had to do our own children's books as part of the class, and then he'd review them. What was interesting about them is that he told us the psychological issues behind his own books like the um, monsters and where the wild things are were based on his uncles who always used to come and pinch his cheeks and they were like monsters to him. And then um, his other book outside over there was based about a changeling and he had a psychological fear of kidnapping after the papers showed the Lindbergh baby kidnapping. So he was always scared, but his, he said his mother always told him, Maurice, they only kidnap rich children, not poor children, so you have nothing to worry about. <laughs> But that's what he'd do. He'd review our books, you know, so you you would write and illustrate the book. That's what he, he encouraged us to do. But then he'd give you the psychological underpinnings of why you wrote the book and what, what the, the real motive and what the real story was. And that helped me, I think, as a writer, too, because when you write a book, you have to think about your characters. What are their psychological motivations? What makes them who they are? It's not just plot. It's really a lot about the characters. So I really, you know, thank him for that, for, t for training me that way. And he was a very generous person, like a lot of other writers, as you mentioned, in the writing community, I mean, have been so incredible. Um, Ann Perry, who recently passed away, had blurbed my first book. And I met her at a conference and she, we had an ongoing dialogue with each other and she would give me ideas and we'd talk about who do we cast as the main characters if our books were movies and things like that. So I think that, you know, having that feedback from people like that who are generous with their feedback is really encouraging for writers. Once you actually wrote the book, how did you proceed? Did you search for an agent, decide to choose a hybrid, a small press, or did you self-publish? So what happened was, as I mentioned, I, Save those writers magazine and I had written I had started this book it wasn't called the gallery beauties there but it was the start of that and um, I had about 8,000 words and I went to the and I saw killer Nashville this conference and I said I'm going to try to go to that one I really want to go there so I went to this conference killer Nashville and at killer Nashville they have these round table um, editor and agent reviews and what happens is you give in two pages of your manuscript and then without your name on it, and then they pass it around, somebody reads it, and the panel of editor and agents comment on it. So I figured this is my chance to see, can I really write? Am I really do know what I'm doing? So I gave my two pages in and the um, one of the agents right away read it and said, this is fantastic and I want the full manuscript. Now, at the time, I had no idea what that meant. But luckily, at the conference, during co coffee, I met these ladies from Sisters in Crime. And they were so friendly, and they were so nice, and they were so generous with their time. And then I told them what happened during the agent roundtable. And I said, I don't know what to do because I don't have a full manuscript. And they said, well, first of all, you should understand. They explained to me the route that you usually don't get an ask for a full. You get an ask for 25 pages, then 50 pages, then 100 pages. And when they ask for a full, it means they really, really like it. So I was really excited. And this agent was a very, they said she's not an agent who usually asks for full. So it was a really good thing. But um, so I, they said, just send her an email and said, you'll get back to her in three months. You want to polish it up. So I did that. I finished the, the uh, manuscript in about three, four months, but I didn't know that you don't send in your first draft. <laughs> so I had no idea. Um, so I sent in my first draft and she said it's not ready for publication. And then luckily I started, got, you know, after that first conference, I joined up. Sisters in Crime has a um, online group called Guppies. It stands for the Great Unpublished. And everybody shares tips and you can take classes through guppies. 
So I took classes through a lot of different things. They have classes from structuring the story to building character arcs. Um, they give you tips and about conferences too. So I went to two other conference, conferences, which are craft conferences that really help you work on your story. One of them was uh, New England Crime Bake, where they do a critique of your manuscript, and then you sit with an author, you know, a known author who will critique your manuscript and then tell you what to, you know, what what the weaknesses, what the strengths are. And then I went to um, Sleuth Fest in Florida, which was another where they had a lot of work sessions. And I pitched to another six agents there, all who asked me for the manuscript, but it wasn't ready yet. So finally, I realized I needed a developmental editor, which is a big investment, but it was really, really helpful because she helped me understand I'm not, I wasn't, you know, even if you're a good writer, you don't know what the standards are. You don't know what, what they're looking for. You don't know the practice. You don't know how to build tension. And she taught me all that. And she restructured the whole, she told me how to restructure. I mean, she doesn't write it for you, but she explains to you how to overcome the weaknesses of your manuscript. And then after I did that, I started sending it out again. And at that point, I sent it, somebody on Sisters in Crime posted, oh, my publisher is looking for new manuscripts. If anybody wants to contact them, please contact them. So I contacted them. I hadn't really gone to any more agents. I just happened to contact Level Best Books, which is my publisher. And then within a few weeks, they sent me back, we want to publish this book and we want you to publish two, out, two more. So they wanted a series and um, with the same characters. And that's why, it ha and, and it was a two year lead time till, it, till they come out, which most, um, that was, that's generous for the first book. Because once you get your second book, and your third book, you usually get only a few months to come up with the sequels. But by then, you should know your characters. It should be easier. So after that, um, Gallery of Beauties came out. And, uh, and then right away, you have to get started on the next one, which is when I got started on Courtesan Secret. And I'm starting on the third right now. <laughs> Now, Nina, you are living a charmed life because that is a quick process. You had so many people, so many agents and publishers wanting that book. So that's very unusual for a right. debut novel. Right. But it wasn't ready when they wanted it. They liked I was very look, I mean, in advertising, I didn't. So I know how to pitch. So I think that's why they all wanted my book. So I can't emphasize enough is that you have to learn how to pitch too. Because even though I'm in advertising and I know how to sell, there's an art to the pitch. And at those conferences, Sleuth Fest in particular, they helped us write our pitches, practice our pitches, and so you get the pitch right. But then after that, and most of the agents said that most of the time they reject novels because they're just not polished enough. They're not ready yet for publication. And that was my problem is that I needed to get to understand how to polish it for publication. How did writing that first book change your process of writing? Um, like I said, I really didn't understand how to lay out a novel. From there, um, that first book taught me um, I also learned how to do dual voices, dual viewpoints, which also adds a lot more pacing to a book. And um, that really helped a lot. And creating suspense by what I did is I used the voice of the bad guy in the book. So you kind of know the bad guy stalking the heroine. And that adds a little more tension and anticipation to it. And that helped me with the pacing the most. Um, but that also was learned based on going to a lot of these classes. Uh, the developmental editor put that in, helped me with that too. Um, I think the one big thing that I didn't know which was a big aha, was to keep your book to one point of view at the max two or three. Because when you're a writer and you're used to, we're all very oriented to film and you're used to looking at different points of view and it's very, and then you start writing and all of a sudden people are head jumping and your audience can't follow you. So that was the first big learning that once I got that, it helped me focus when you tell, when you start the next book, you have to make that decision. Whose head are you going to be in for this book? And don't make it too many. So that was really the biggest aha moment for me. 
Well, you must have found a formula for writing these, and and you you've got to have gotten even quicker with these deadlines looming. Have you got a specific writing routine that you do, and and how long does it take you actually to finish a manuscript? I don't really have a writing routine because I still work full time, so I try to squeeze writing in on the weekends. But one thing I've learned is that I have to plan the book out in my head. So I think about it every night before I go to sleep. I think about scenes, and then I, I'm going to write them. The other thing that I learned, which is very, very helpful, and the publisher often makes you do this, is to write a synopsis of your second of your book. So that ends up being like your blueprint. And even if it's not quite right, you kind of know where the story is going. Um, so that helped me. And then I took out books on how to lay out the different chapters. So I did lay them out. There's one called Save the Cat that tells you chapter by chapter and different different kind of tropes to follow, like hero's journey or things like that, that you can follow. So you build every chapter and they tell you what to do in every chapter, which is very helpful. And I did that. So it helps you lay out the story and that makes it easier to write because you know what you're doing. But you still, I still have to dream about it at night and be that because I think the hardest thing is when you're writing a book, you have to be your character and you have to be able to understand it from their point of view. And the only time that I find that I have real time to get into that character's head is at night before I go to sleep. Now, I've heard a lot of writers who say they dream certain yeah. scenarios and their premise and they wake up and have to write it down. Yeah, that's what I do, too. I dream it all out. And I think the more you write about certain characters, you know them already. And so then once you know them, you you are you kind of figure out you're in their lives and you say, what's going to happen to them next? What's going to happen to them in this next? And, and you leave off your last book wondering, what are you going to do with them in the next book? And I think a lot of writers have said had always said to me is that, I didn't decide what my character character was going to do. They decided it. And that's when you know you've, you're, you've created a real character because it does happen. I didn't believe it was going to happen, but it does happen that the character um, takes over, right? I didn't believe it either, but they really do start talking to us. Right. They really do. And what helped me in the beginning is one um, to create characters voice because you want to have another big thing is how do you have distinct voices between your characters? You don't want all your characters to sound the same, which you can do, which ha can happen if you're the writer because you can't differentiate and you hear them in your mind. But one, um, one session I went to at Sleuth Fest, a writer had mentioned that he was working as, you know, uh, uh, what's his name? James Patterson hires co-writers all the time. And that the, James Patterson would give him directions on how to write a chapter. And he would say to him, write this chapter in the voice of Bill Murray from Stripes. So once he did that, he knew exactly what that voice was. So I realized I could do that too, because you have in your mind, in the back of your mind, these characters that may conjure up, you know, old movie stars that you could see playing them. So I, I love classic movies. And I was writing one character and I didn't know what this character was going to be. I couldn't figure out the voice. And then I thought of George Sanders. I don't know if you've heard of him. George Sanders from the old movies. He was in Rebecca. He was in Forever Amber. And he had this droll, bored kind of voice. And that's what I needed for a nobleman. And once I, caught, once I started thinking through that voice, first of all, it became very distinctive. And second of all, the character took shape in a whole different direction than I thought it would. So I think it does help when you do that. It's great to visualize, you know, whether it's a character from your own life or whether it's a, a mix of lots of diff different personality traits. I think it really does help to do that. Mm -hmm. Well, being in advertising, you may not find the same challenges that a lot of writers find, but so many writers want to write. They don't want to promote themselves. They don't want to be involved in the publicity, but even the big five publishing companies are now requiring their authors to do most of their own publicity. Have you found anything that works for you or maybe that doesn't work? Well, I think the best advice I got and my publisher does give us like a marketing 
guideline brochure so we can know what to do. But the best advice I got is whatever social media platform you're comfortable with and you're on, do it on there. Because don't take on another platform because it's too much of a learning curve. So I've never used Twitter. Um, and that's because I, I work in the pharmaceutical industry and they're terrified of Twitter. So I never use Twitter. But we, I, we do, I have used Instagram a lot and Facebook, and that's where I was on. So that was easier for me. And then um, I do like creative stuff. I like doing creative. So I found Canva. Again, another, art, another writer recommended it, where I can do my own artwork on there. So that made a lot easier. And I've also used Squarespace, which is a very easy-to-use website builder. Um, so those were the things that I was able to do because I had some sensibilities to it, but they're very easy to use tools. But the other thing is I found if you don't know how to use something, like I didn't know how to use Instagram really well. How do you build fat followers? Well, I knew I have grandchildren and my oldest grandchild is 16. And, you know, kids really know social media. So I said to her, my eldest grandchild, I said, I know, you know, social media, you're on it all the time. Could you create an Instagram, you know, uh, site for me and start posting and build me followers? And I'll give you a dollar for every follower you build for me. So I figured she'll get me, I don't know, 250 followers. Well, in two weeks, she got me 2,000 followers. And I had to pay her $2,000. <laughs> that is great. Now, that's well worth those dollars. But that's what I would suggest because if you're an author, rather than going and hiring a public publicity agent, you know, to do a lot of these social platforms, find a kid, because those kids, they know TikTok, they know Instagram, they're not so much on Facebook, but Facebook's a lot easier. Um, but find a kid and just give them photos or, or pieces of art or ideas, and they'll post for you and you don't have to pay them a lot. And they know what they're doing. So because this is their language. Um, so I found that easier because the only thing I knew that I think advertising helped me is because I was creative director. I knew how to create my own artwork. But again, you can find somebody who can do the creative for you or have a talented kid do the creative for you. But there are a lot of kids out there who will do the work for very little and will do a very good job for you. That's a great idea. But I do think a lot of um, publishers now will ask the writer, even in, when you're pitching them, They'll ask you, I noticed on some of the submissions I did, they're asking you for your marketing plan up front. So, um, and a lot of them, my, my publisher also asked how many Instagram followers had, how many Facebook followers I had. They didn't have too many Instagram, but I don't think you have to worry about that as long as you could give them a idea of what you like to do. Like if you like speaking in person, if you know people in book fear, you know, book uh, clubs, just that could be your venue. Whatever you're comfortable doing, I do think, you know, that's what you should start with, whatever you're comfortable doing and tell your publisher and your publisher will help you. The bigger publishers give you more, the indie publishers give you less, but there's you know, you had asked before why go with a big one or a little one. So I ended up not having an agent who you need to go to the bigger publishers. And I ended up going to an independent publisher. But my publisher, all the, the, the people who own it are all writers themselves. And that helps a lot because there's a lot less, there's a lot more tolerance. And they treat us better, I think. They don't give us as much support as the big, big companies. But they understand when you can't make a deadline. Like if you can't make it and you need an extra two months, they're okay with that. And if you're not gonna be able to promote your book, like they'll give you lead time. Like a lot of publishers, they expect you to sell like a ton of books the first two months or you're out. And our, my publisher is not like that. So that's the trade-offs you get. They don't force you to go on book tours if you can't do it because of your schedule or your, your family or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's the trade-off you have to have. As writers, we just have so many options these days that writers just a few years ago didn't have, you know, with right. the micro presses or the small presses and and uh, self-publishing. So there are a lot more options today. Yeah, and I think self-publishing gives you a lot more control once you get the hang of how to do the advertising. Like I'm now taking a course in Amazon advertising, which is an 
entire science on itself on how to do that. So you can take those courses online and learn it yourself. And the self-published offers like Colleen Hoover did all her stuff herself. And they built millions of followers that way because you have more control over your your what you're doing, your marketing, when you control all aspects of it. And also you make more money that way. I know a lot of authors who started off traditional publishing and now are self-publishing because they're making a lot more money that way. Absolutely. Well, Nina, why don't you tell us a little bit about the passage that you brought to share today and then read from your book so we can hear your tone and voice. Okay, so this passage that I'm going to read is actually, remember I said how to put some things in the voice of the bad guy to create a little tension? So this is, and I'm reading it because it's short, but it gives you an idea of this bad guy who ends up, you know, you do have some, a lot of people liked him because <laughs> he was a reluctant bad guy. But the story is about an artist um, he's commissioned to paint the portrait of the 12 most beautiful women in Venice for a visiting English nobleman. And he also goes among all the people, all the women, anybody he sees that he thinks inspires him. And one of the people he sees is the rabbi's daughter, who happens to be in the Rialto market in Venice. And he thinks she's so stunningly beautiful, he asks her to pose for him. And she's conflicted about doing that, because first of all, there was it was dangerous to leave the ghetto and to go up with a strange man. But she's also, this rabbi's daughter is a widow and a scholar, and she has never been exposed to art. And she's so curious about the artist and how he paints. And she also believes there's some kind of Kabbalistic transfer of souls when an artist paints her. So that's what motivates her to go. But he he's painting all the other illustrious women of Venice. Um, and, and one of them is a famous courtesan in which he introduces her to, and they, the two of them become friends. And then one by one, these women who are the subjects of the portraits are found poisoned. So the scene I'm going to read now is of the first victim and how she is found. Okay. And they're all poisoned and Venice was the capital of poison. So poison was not an unusual experience over there. So um, this just gives you an idea, okay? A beautiful woman, richly dressed in fine velvet and silvery brocade, lay reclining in the seat, but strangely not moving. Her unmarked skin was pale, and she seemed as if she were deep in sleep, the fine lace of her bodice forming a shroud for her throat. As frozen as a statue, and although it was cold and da damp, she gave not one shiver, and made no attempt to huddle or close her half-open cloak. A gondolier, the upper half of his face hidden by a white bottom mask, plowed through the lagoon, his long pole rising and plunging into its depths, steering the gondola forward. He paid no attention to his passenger and focused only on the path ahead. Bracing himself as he faced the chilling wind, his eyes stung as he squinted, trying to catch sight of his destination the dazzling palazzo ahead. The masked gondolier pulled on, aiming for the open gates that marked the entryway where he would leave his passenger. After securing his craft, however, he would not join the other gondoliers who waited in anticipation for the palazzo's bounty, the savory dishes from the table of the city's wealthiest courtesan. Torches were ablaze along the white stone facade, and their flames danced across the waters of the canal, creating a rippling golden path. The gondolier had to pull with all his might against the wind to access the entryway. He pulled the, bo the boat through the tall iron gates, pulling it up to the pier on the ground floor of the palazzo. Out of the wind, the gondolier wiped his streaming eyes and steadied the craft against the rough stones of the landing. Jumping off, he fastened the ropes to a striped wooden pole. When he was sure he had tied it securely, he moved to the other side of the gondola and peered into the cabin. No sign of movement and the passenger's face lay hidden in shadow. No hand reached out to, crest, to clasp the sides, and there was no sound of rustling silk to signal the passenger's intent to rise. The gondolier leaned nearly all the way into the cabin, listening for the sound of breathing. There was none. Looking quickly from side to side and seeing no one, he removed his mask. He had to take several deep breaths without it to keep from fainting. 
fighting his natural inclination to examine the passenger to see if she could still be alive, he did nothing. He could hear the lapping of the water on the pier, the tinkle of glass from the floor above, and the occasional bursts of laughter from the gondoliers outside. From beneath the prow, he pulled out a thick, dark cloak, wrapping it around himself to keep warm and to cover the distinctive clothing of a gondolier. Taking a deep breath and one last look at the gondola's cabin, he placed a plain black hat on his head and replaced the bought mask. His, his instructions had been specific. The woman must be found in the gondola, dressed for an assignation by the Palazzo of Belladonna. He banged the palm of his hand against his forehead, hoping to free himself of remorse. The woman inside had been a victim of her own ambition. It was because of her he had to take this enormous risk, so alien to his true crawling, which made his stomach churn and bubble. It had to be done. He had no choice. Careful not to look back at the abandoned gondola, he slipped out of the palazzo and hurried down a nearby alleyway. He kept to the shadows until he had left the canal and the palazzo far behind him. That's it. That's so intriguing. <laughs> Thanks. It, and I tried to give that picture of Venice at that time, which is not that far from Venice today, because Venice has not changed very much in 500 years. Right. Did you illustrate your own covers? No, um, but I did find the artwork because I wanted it to be an authentic 17th century woman. So I found this cover for um, Gallery of Beauties, but my second book, which is about the courtesan, Belladonna, I needed to find, I wanted to find authentic pictures of courtesans of Venice. What I found was the courtesans of Venice at that time were all bare-breasted. So all the portraits of them were bare-breasted, which wouldn't work as a cover for the book. So I found a portrait of a 17th century courtesan from England, and I used that because she's got her collar up to her neck. <laughs> so. Nice. Well, as always, our last interview question is, our writers over 50 are quite unique. Do you have advice for writers 50 and above? Yes, my advice is don't delay doing what you want to do. Take the leap, try it, go forth, be patient, because it takes a while. You know, it took me three and a half years to get the first book published, but a lot of writers, including famous writers, took them 10 years and multiple books before they got published. So today you can publish yourself as well. So that takes some of the time off of it. I know writers who said they felt they, you know, they wanted to publish a memoir right away for their family, so they did that. So go ahead and do it. Just make the leap, read up, go online. There's plenty of online courses and groups that you can join to learn from other writers. They'll be happy to teach you, but don't, don't delay, because the sooner you get started, the better off you are. Great advice and so pertinent for our group today, because so many of us are writing in our 70s, 80s, and 90s, and we're still turning out beautiful work. So thank you so much for being with us today from the Big Apple, and we just appreciate you're sharing your story with us, and we're excited to say that you're now counted among our authors over 50. Great. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today. Please look for Authors Over 50 every Thursday when we will have conversations with accomplished debut novelists over the age of 50. Please subscribe and share with a friend. And check out my own publication journey after 50 at www.juliadaily, that's D-A-I-L-Y, like dailynewspaper.com. Until next time, keep reading and writing. And remember, it's never too late to fulfill a dream in life's sweetest third. <laughs>